uh, load on the health services, uh, health services in the health system overall. And the main aim is how do we keep our needs of the health system and how do we keep the pressure and load on the health system within our health system's capacity um, so that, you know, we don't overwhelm the health system and, you know, when we overwhelm the system, you know, something called the thrashing effect starts happening. And even when diseases are not as deadly, uh, people start dying and, you know, the mortality starts increasing just because of the fact that they don't get access to, to health care. Uh, so, um, the outline of the lecture will be, I will basically talk about it in four stages of a crisis management. Uh, it's, it's well known within the literature of crisis management or disaster management that there are four stages to managing a crisis or a disaster. Uh, you know, there's in these four phases of preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. The preparedness stage is basically before the crisis happens. So in our case, before the pandemic actually hits. Um, response is when it act, the crisis actually ar arises in our case, when the pandemic actually reaches our shore and then we have to react to it. The recovery is once we are beyond the response phase, when we are beyond the initial phase and we start returning to a normal and in, in many cases a totally new normal and then mitigation is forward looking as to how we start living with the new normal how we start uh, in our case maybe start living with uh, this this virus um, uh, it, it, you know and share this globe if you will with, with the virus and the way i'll talk about it is in each stage i'll sort of talk about what what are the needs what are the requirements but most importantly how ai and data science is either helping or has the potential to help in each of these phases. Uh, so let's get into it and start with preparedness. You know, preparedness is, of course, you know, when we, this is even before something happens and nothing, there is no alternative for preparedness. You know, every nation, every country, we as a people need to be prepared for crisis, for, for pandemics like this. And I'll, I'll, I'll start with a one minute uh, video uh, uh, from 2005 as well as 2012, 2015 um, about uh, the presidents of the United States, past presidents of the United States talking about potential, uh, potential pandemics. It is vital that our nation discuss and address the threat of pandemic flu now. There is no pandemic flu in our country or in the world at this time. But if we wait for a pandemic to appear, it will be too late to prepare. Pandemic is a lot like a fire, a forest fire. If caught early, it might be extinguished with limited damage. If allowed to smolder, undetected, it can grow to an inferno that spreads quickly beyond our ability to control it. Our strategy is designed to meet three critical goals. First, we must detect outbreaks that occur anywhere in the world. Second, we must protect the American people by stockpiling vaccines and antiviral drugs and improve our ability to rapidly produce new vaccines against a pandemic strain. And third, we must be ready to respond at federal, state, and local levels in the event that a pandemic reaches our shores. We have to put in place an infrastructure, not just here at home, but globally, that allows us to see it quickly, isolate it quickly, respond to it. Quickly. So that if and when, a new strain of flu, like the Spanish flu, crops up five years from now or a decade from now, we've made the investment. And we're further along to be able to catch it. Little did President Obama know that when he said five years from now, he was right on the money. It actually did happen five years from when he made the speech. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll slide, you know, we'll slowly parse all of this. You know, we heard a lot of terms of, uh, you know, stockpiling and, you know, may, may, many of these things. So we'll start, uh, slowly start, you know, unraveling all of this during the course of the presentation. Um, as you as, uh, Notice, you know, one of the things was how do we catch this even before our even before it starts reaching our shore? Uh, 
So AI is, you know, it, it can be used in early identification of these pandemics. Um, there, there's, there's a company in Toronto called Blue Dot that actually predicted not only that this is going to get into a pandemic even before this was a pandemic, um, it also it also mapped out the transmission of which countries will will be affected next and how they will be affected. Um, unfortunately, no one paid attention to them at that time. Um, you know, after this became a pandemic, people started paying attention to this the, this company and in the Canadian government now uses them to model the uh, transmission and model, model the growth of this pandemic within Canada, you know, and, and it, it, it uses, you know, it uses population characteristics, it uses travel data from flights, travel mobility patterns within the country, uh, and, and, you know, so on and so forth. And, and, you know, so, so there are artificial intelligence techniques that actually can identify early enough these things. And, you know, interestingly, you know, there, there was a very, um, in very early days during my PhD, I uh, you know, wrote a paper on automatic, uh, automated syndromic surveillance um, from New York pre-hospital care reports. And at the time, you know, the, the, the driver wasn't really a pandemic. It, it was post 9-11 uh, era and uh, people were wor worried about bioterrorism. And um, we had access, you know, I was, in, I was in New York, I was doing my PhD in New York, and we had access to what we call this New York State's pre-hospital care report forms. Um, and um, every, every time someone calls 911 and the first responders uh, respond to it, they fill out this PR, PCR form. And the idea was using these PCR forms to perform uh, automated syndromic surveillance, you know, by finding unusual patterns or symptoms that could potentially point to a, uh, you know, a bioterrorist uh, attack. Uh, and, and it can be used the same thing for, for, um, for, for pandemics. And interestingly, just over the last um, few weeks, you know, on research data, I saw that this paper was being read 3,000 times, you know, people going back to the old type of research on, on, on how these can be used to to just uh, perform early identification. Um, once, you know, uh, early, you know, we talked about early identification, you know, there was also another term that was thrown in in the presentation, which was called stockpiling. Um, th this is a common term, you know, where we think of it as a backup inventory of essentials. You, you know, hospitals and healthcare centers, they have their own uh, supply chain. But there has to have there has to be a stockpile, a backup at a federal level, at a government level um, of these essentials. Um, under the, um, the Preparedness for Pandemics Act in the United States, um, uh, the government was mandated to create a strategic national stockpile. And what basically meant is that we that they would store uh, vaccines, drugs, uh, personal protective equipments, ventilators. And imagine all of these things that we need uh, in this current pandemic with an aim to be able to deploy these resources at a 12 hour notice. Uh, so where does artificial intelligence come into this stockpiling? You know, now there are major considerations to what, you know, of stockpiling, you know, what do we stockpile? How much do we stockpile? How do we send help and where do we send help? And these are areas where artificial intelligence has or, or, or will help. So, for example, the stockpiling strategy, me meaning what to stockpile and how much to stockpile. Uh, this is all data driven. This is all being used. You know, there are these there are artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms being used in all of this. Um, so, how do we demand what our invent inventory? How do we create uh, what our inventory would be on based on different prediction of the demand? Um, and again, you know, the parameters that would go in would be uh, the medical vulnerability vulnerability of the population how the threats occurred in the past, what was the need in the past, how we, you, uh, you know, how we respond to them in the future, you know, which me medicines are easily available, readily available, what medical supplies will we need, will we run off, short off, and so on and so forth. And again, some of the factors would be, of course, storing everything has a cost, there's efficiency needed for it. Um, so all of those go into machine learning models. So, so think of an in, in, you know, in, in inventory management system you know, it, it really ties well into, a, you know, a type of machine learning we call reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning, 
think of this as a, an agent or a robot, uh, you know, not a real robot, could be a, you know, a, software, ro a software agent that's working within a system, has a particular state, and performs a certain action. And based on that action, it gets a reward and goes into some other state. Um, and, you know, these inventory management systems, you know, tie very well into this kind of a machine learning model where, you know, you have penalty if something, you know, you, uh, you, your penalties to these algorithms, if there's, if something goes out of stock, if there's something stays on the shelf for too long, that again is a penalty. There's a reward every time you're able to meet a demand by having something in stock. And then there are actions that you perform and you get uh, on the state, action state. And, you know, using these inventory management, you know, machine learning systems it was noticed, you know, in the, in the past, that there's at, you know, in one, you know, at least a 30% increase in the efficiency, you know, reduction of cost, meeting demand and so on and so forth. So, so, you know, the, once you have these stockpiles, the next important thing is how do we respond? when there is a need for these, uh, these things. How do we respond and quickly make sure that they are enabled? And that's where you know, AI again comes in. Um, it, it's been heavily used in the current pandemic on rapid response logistics. You know, UK Department of Transportation and approved use of AI enabled drones, you know, deliver medical supplies, kits and, you know, draw, you know medications and whatnot. In fact, in China, they used these drones to deliver swab samples. So you know, they had many of these testing stations, and they um, they used drones to transport these swab samples from these you know swab stations to this Chinese Center for Disease Control. And you know another thing in the past that happened was you know a kidney was transported by a drone um, to the University of Maryland Medical Center in the United States. So 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 you know basically not just the response. For, for the actual pandemic, but remember there are there are needs within the pandemic that ca that can be impacted by the pandemic. The regular needs that are happening in daily life, something like a kidney transplant, and there was AI being used uh, being used uh, in, in there. So, so Faisal, any idea what kind of AI was being used in the drones? Was it the you know they were like flying out of range or or any any. So, so some of the things that were being used is basically, uh, you know, uh, if I, which which locations, for example, send it to. Right, so, uh, let's go. Let's you know th think of um, uh, the, the the Department of Transportation. You know, they enable multiple drones, uh, and you know they were at multiple places. So how do we how do you schedule which drones to use? Which is the nearest drone? Um, then uh, the other thing, of course, using uh, using vision technology to be able to navigate and and used and, and then of course gps technology can be used um in in the in the chinese uh, in the chinese uh, case where you know they uh, deliver swap samples the optimization needed to be done was how to reduce the time of sending these swap samples to the to the uh, center for disease control and basically the idea was sending those drones um and keeping that at strategic location so which location the drone should be sent out of to the nearest location, to the nearest swap station, and then getting it back. So, you know, more of state scheduling issues on which, you know, which drones to send where um, in, in, in these uh, situations. Great. Thank you. So another important thing that has come about is in terms of preparedness. And again, you know, people often underestimate this, but this is this is critical. And now we, you know, it has shown it has shown during our current pandemic the need for build, building these national health data platforms. Um, because it's it's critical to access the in, in information that uh, is generated, you know, especially clinical information or epidemiological inform information. And to be honest, you know, you know, uh, participation in these uh, near real time population health registries sh should be mandatory for all hospitals, for all care providers. Um, and you know, it, it's always been on the back burner. It's always been on strategic charts, you know, strategic charts and powerpoints. You know, every time a consultant is paid big dollars, they will come and give you these big presentations of need for these health data platforms, but often has lacked execution. But if the current pandemic has shown us anything that in order to drive these AI algorithms and data-driven decisions, 
where you know the right data can save lives at the right time, we need these national health data platforms. In fact, NHS just partnered with a tech giant to, to develop uh, a COVID-19 data platform. And in fact, they plan to grow it into a bigger national data platform, but at least start off with a COVID-19 platform. So, so again, so this was sort of talking about the, um, the preparedness aspects of what we could do or what we could have done uh, you know, before the pandemic started. Um, let's go into the response phase, which we are really living right now, you know, because we are currently in the response phase of the of the pandemic. So, uh, you know, the, the health system is, is a is a quartet, anybody, you know, anybody that knows what a quartet is, it's four, four people uh, singing group or four people music music group, right? But the health system is really a quartet, you know, it, it works on four pillars, right? Um, the primary care, you know, where it's more wellness and, uh, you know, and, and the first, uh, first contact with physicians. And there's secondary care, you know, where referrals happen, you know, specialty care, like cardiology or orthopedics and whatnot. Then there's acute care, you know, for hospitalizations, that's, that's our tertiary care facilities. And then long-term facilities like, you know, nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities and whatnot. And the assumption is that any, at any given point of time, only a small fraction of the population uses this entire quartet. Now, in a pandemic, what happens is, what could happen is the percentage of population rises significantly, it becomes too big, or it rises too quickly for, for us to be able to respond, which leads to a health system collapse, leading to high mortality. Um, and that's why we, are talk we keep talking about, as, as Sanjay mentioned, we keep talking about these non-pharmaceutical inter interventions like social distancing and shutdowns. And the idea really is to keep us within that capacity. So how do we know how to manage all of these things? And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how we usually model the epidemic, but again, you know, I, I'll very briefly touch over this, but uh, you know, on May 7th, uh, Sanjay and uh, some of his colleagues will lead, um, will lead a session actually that will go into detail on, on how we model these epidemics. So, uh, in, uh, in epidemiology, people use these compartmental models where people are assigned to compartments and they can move between compartments. Uh, a popular um, model is called the SEIR model, where you know people are susceptible. You know, think of this: a fraction of population which is 100% of the population is susceptible. That's that's the blue curve. And slowly, people start getting exposed and infected, uh, and either recover or 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 die. So so this is the uh, the compartment, the susceptible compartment, the exposed compartment, the infection compartment, and then covered compartment, or, 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 or people that are removed from the system because they die. Uh, because we're interested in the health services and management of health services, we're most, we're very, really interested in this part of the curve, this piece of the puzzle, which is your, your infected curve. So, you know, let's, let's zoom into the infected curve. And think of if our if that orange line here is our health system's capacity, and it's you know it's usually flat, but I'll I'll talk about it later. Um, if this is our capacity, and that that uh, curve is which we zoomed uh, zoomed into, as you can see here, this is what represents a health system collapse. You know, right now the need for the health system is significantly larger than what our health system can actually cater to. And this is what a health system collapses. So in order to prevent this, you know, we have been hearing these terms like social distancing and, you know, where social distancing sort of more on an individual level. And then, you know, we have shutdowns that are government enforced and regulated. Um, and the idea really is that we reduce the number of people that are exposed and susceptible at any given point of time, thereby reducing the infected curve. Now, social distancing or these shutdowns, it's, it's not a one size fits all, right? you know, it's just not shut down everything in, uh, and, and that's it. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about something called a social distancing factor, which basically means that if we do social distancing at an individual level, think of we're reducing our social, uh, reducing our social contact by 10%. Similarly, you know, if, uh, if parks and other things, recreation will close under 10%, uh, schools will close maybe 20% and so on and so forth. So, uh, and I ran a simulation on how this would pan out. Um, so this is the scenario where we had no social distancing 
uh, let's say we now uh, close down all the recreation parks and it will bring down um, bring down the curve and we are now starting to flatten the curve. Let's say we add another thing and we start uh, shut down schools, that brings it down further. And then so on and so forth till we reach a point where, as you can see this purple curve, now we are under our health capacity. Which basically means that any, at any given point of time, even at the time of our maximum need, our health system can still manage um, the number of people that are requesting services. Now, this, this, all of this has only one side of the story. What we're missing here is that all of these shutdowns also lead to economic impact. Um, this is a slide HSBC prepared. This is basically the percentage contribution towards the GDP in the United States by each sector. And, and it also shows that a week of shutdown within each sector, how much of an impact on the economy it has. Long story short, one week of shutdown can actually impact economy by you know half a percent, point eight percent, which which is huge. And um, you know Sanjay was recently telling me that you know uh, the economy shrunk by one point something percent here, or in the in the GCC area in the U.S. Actually, in the last quarter, the economy shrunk by four and a half percent in the first quarter of uh, of 2020. So this has very uh, you know significant impacts, and this impacts our our future as 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 a people. So now, so basically what happens then is that it's not just the social impact factor that we need to look at. We also need to look at what is that economic impact that's going to happen by doing this. So as we go down the curves and we flatten it more and more, we also make need, which also means that we are making our economic situation, situation worse. So then where, where, so, you know, how do we do these data driven lockdowns is, if this is the curve where, you know, as we are following the, the, the peak of the social, you know, peaks of social distancing, is there a way we can operate somewhere where the economic impact we, is still manageable? Of course, there will be some, but it's not as uh, disastrous as the last one. But at the same time, as you can see, that means that we will be about our capacity. How do we manage that capacity? So the idea really is that Without mitigation, this is what happens, but in reality, we will also increase the healthcare capacity somehow. Um, so, so we act on both situations, and that way what we can do is we can do we can do a you know phased shutdown and not a complete shutdown at the same time, making sure that we also sort of shore our shore up our economy. So how do we now increase healthcare capacity? Of course, one simple way of doing it is, you know, on the left side, you'll see. Uh, picture and uh, where I come from in New York, this is uh, one of the largest convention centers there it's called the Jacob Javits Center. And there's a lot of AI and machine learning conferences actually, by the way, that I have attended in, in this center. And um, this particular event uh, is probably the, uh, the Comic Con uh, Festival. And, you know, you know, you convert the center like that into this, in, in, into a makeshift hospital. And that's what the Jacob Javits Center right now is in New York. Because New York was really the hub of the pandemic within the United States. Now, this can increase our capacity definitely, but this is something which is not feasible for every country. This is something that is economically draining. This is requires marshalling of resources and logistics at, at, a, at a phenomenal scale. So what we do in other situations is to make sure then how do we organically increase the capacity within the health system by trying to schedule it in a way, by trying to process it in a way that at any given point of time, the number of people that actually need that capacity, need that particular segment of the healthcare, be it primary care or secondary care or tertiary care, is less than the actual need, uh, is that the actual capacity? By sort of distributing it over, um, over, the, over the spectrum. To be able to do that, what we need to understand is which pieces of the puzzle are being impacted the most. So in the current pandemic, for example, in COVID-19, the key areas that are being impacted are emergency rooms, you know, where it's outcrowding the emergency rooms. It's putting a strain on outpatient clinics by, you know, people having symptoms and they want to know, do I have COVID? They want to rush into these hospitals, you know, these uh, primary care or, you know, outpatient clinics. Then once someone is hospitalized and they may need ventilators, you know, they need to go on ventilators and within ICUs, then our ICU capacity is being strained. 
And then there's also the collateral damage. You know, the you know, I, I just recently read this piece of news where you know a hospital, in order to make space for COVID-19 uh, patients, was discharging or forcefully discharging their patients. And one such patient, there was news of such one such patient that was discharged and died in two days. Right. So that's your indirect impact of um, of of uh, on the health system that that uh, this has. So how do we now? Uh, spread this, spread the resource uh, need or allocation in such a way that at any given point of time, none of these is is overwhelmed. To come to you know for that, WHO came up with guidelines. And again, these are not actionable steps, but these are just guidelines that WHO came up with. Um, they come up came up with a general preparedness and response plan for 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 the current pandemic. It had eight pillars of operation, and they covered all aspects. Um, the, as the pillar that specifically talked about the health capacity was this pillar seven was case management. And the actions that it has to be taken was to make sure that we map vulnerable populations, we increase capacity by you know, spreading things between private, public, and alternative facilities, making sure we identify our intensive care capacity, Access continuously the burden, and then there is sufficient guidance on self care for the patients. So, what does this now translate into? How how you know data driven tools and AI is, is helping in each of them. So, you know this is this is a report from Imperial College London where it was sort of the initial uh, reports on the mapping cast mapping case severity by age. And again, this is not the only way you, we map uh, the case severity because you know, we have to take into consideration pre-existing populations and vulnerable populations and so on and so forth. But in this case, I'm, I'm only looking at, for example, stratification by age. And as you can see, the hospitalization rates for younger people are much lower than the hospitalization rates for older people. And then the fatality ratio is also you know, much lower. So how can we use this? You know, if we, for example, Try to project what our demand is going to be simply based on this. Again, this is only the age, and we have to look at other things. But in this particular simulation that I mapped onto the previous simulations, is I'm only looking at age. And what this basically means is now, if I go back to those three scenarios of social distancing that that you know we used in the simulation, and map this age uh, severity um, caseload on it, we'll see that. If we do nothing, of course, we're, we're about capacity for a particular, uh, you know, health system. But if we map the age on age, you know, depending based on our population mix, the age on it, we'll, we'll see that even with the simplest of scenarios, if the R, if the reproduction rate is, let's say, two, even though the literature has talked about anything between two and two point six, so I just ran a simulation for all of them. We are under capacity for most of the time, <laughs> and for a particular reproduction number, we can increase our social distancing and and still be within capacity. Now, how do we do that? We basically make sure that the people that are not at, at, as high as risk can stay out of the hospitals, can stay out of the emergency rooms, can you know can be taken care of either in the outpatient or in their homes. By by proper triaging, proper uh, you know, uh, uh, and proper management. Some of the tools being used, you know, the, the AI or data science tools being used are <coughs> self-assessment tools. Uh, you know, there's many of these tools that are that were created during this time. In fact, this is one created by United States uh, Center for Disease Controls with Apple. And, and it's an app that everyone can download and try to get a self-assessment so to reduce. People going to, to to physicians. In fact, you know, we at QCR I also created a self assessment tool for the region in eleven languages, and these tools have been used millions of times. You know, even our our own QCRI tool has been used over a million uh, by over a million people. And what this basically does is, people can now, uh, you know, whoever has questions and is worried can take these self assessment tools and and is informed about what next steps should they should they take. There's so. Uh, Faisal, a quick question here: uh, Is is uh, 
So the question was, is Qatar, if you go back to the previous slide, is Qatar actually using some of these ideas here, like the risk ratification case load? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So um, there, there are strategic, plan there is strategic planning being done within Qatar because of how our age mix is within the country. Um, you know, as a country, we are a very young country. You know, a majority of our population is young. Um, and, and, and thank God that's because of, that's one of the big reasons why the severity within Qatar, even though we had about 14,000 so cases right now, you know, our mortality is, is, is very low. Only 12 people have died, died so far. And our ICUs are also not overwhelmed. So yes, people are actually using a lot of this risk stratification to understand what capacity should I need. Um, there isn't a lot of emphasis right now. Again, that's probably you know because of lack of data, like, you know, uh, within you know uh, country and and not just Qatar. It's it's global. It's prob It's a prob uh, problem globally on how do we do phase shutdowns? Which shutdown should we do? What is the economic impact? So to be on the safer side is basically sort of taking an all or none approach and only keeping essential services open. So those things are being done, but at the, at a at a hospital and utilization that will definitely these things are being considered for managing capacity for you know, when when should I create another hospital? For example, the hospital in Al Khor uh, was now is now a completely COVID nineteen hospital. All non COVID patients have been transferred to some other places. So that's part of how we increase capacity based on these ratios of and risk stratification. Thank you. So, um, you know, there's other tools that have been created. You know, the, uh, this, this is an AI based tool created by Google. It's called COVID, COVID Near You. Um, and it's got, it, it's a it's, it's tool uh, to understand hotspots, basically. You know, people can use this app and enter their symptoms on a daily basis. And based on their inputs, you know, as you can see, this, this app says that your contribution will inform public health through real time insights. So this basically shows if there are hotspots coming up within particular zip codes and zip code is, in, is, is a zone, is a, is a local area within, within the United States. And people use this app and enter the symptoms. And if, the, if a lot of people are entering these symptoms, that means this, this potential, this place is potentially becoming a hotspot and there will be a strain on, on public health so that they can forecast, forecast case, case load. Now, again, you know, as on, on a side note, um, uh, Google did create something called the Google flu tracker uh, before this and, you know, and then, and, and that failed miserably um, uh, or, or our, you know, after some time, because at that time they were using uh, people searching about flu, uh, not uh, entering their systems, people search about flu and that really changes seasonally. So, you know, using that as a surrogate. And so, so, again, using these data driven things that do come with pitfalls. But again, you know, um, yeah, they have to be used correctly. This is one of the AI tools that that being used. Now, in triage, this is the extremely important uh, thing that we, uh, you know AI is being used, and in many places it's not used, and you know there's there's a lot of potential to be used. So, for example, we don't use any of this in in Qatar or any places. Even in the United States, it's not used all over the places. In mean, only in among only really high end hospitals, um, th this is currently being used. So, um, and, and what this basically does is, you know, the, uh, the AI tools using, using past data and the current uh, data of the patient generate a disposition, whether you should be sending them home, you know, how, how much of a risk they are at. So should be, you should be sending them home, should they be hospitalized, you know, ICU, put on ECMO and whatnot. And then you can continuously monitor them if there, if there are changes. In fact, in certain countries, they're proactively using the tools, even without people showing any symptoms, even without people coming to the hospitals, from their patient uh, registries, creating at-risk pools and prioritizing them for testing, prioritizing them for monitoring. You know, this is all, these are AI tools that are already being, being used um, for that. Now, once, as, uh, you know, once a decision has been made that this particular patient, you know, would be a young person who has, um, who has COVID-19, but you know, is, is not considered high at high risk. How do we make sure that they are monitored um, at home so that you know the situation gets worse? Um, and sort of not just relying on them either coming back or making a phone call. Uh, so you know, for this this is something that's being used in in, in Oxford, in United Kingdom. Uh, this is what the patient, you know, on the left side, uh, you'll see this is what the patient is given. You know, they are 
you know, this is a pulse oximeter, that, you know, and there are other things, heart rate and other things that these devices monitor. And, uh, you know, the app is downloaded either on their iPad or on their phone. And then this is the doctor's view of these, where these are four, for example, four patients that they are monitoring. And these are all four patients that are, you know, that are in their homes um, being monitored by, um, by these physicians using these devices. And, and, and these systems will gen then generate alerts if, for example, someone's uh, oxygen saturation starts decreasing, which is, which is a common thing that happens in patients that end up in ICU for, for the current COVID-19. Uh, they can be called back and say, you know, and, and to go with that, there is, you know, the concept of telemedicine, you know, again, this is, this is a, you know, company, Teladoc, United States, to sort of an Uber of physicians, an AI-based app. Um, this has seen 40% increase over the last few, uh, few weeks um, because of COVID-19. Um, what this basically does is it not only provides care for people that are experiencing symptoms or want to ask about COVID-19, but also provides continuity of care for people in general, you know, that are either, um, you know, may have a common flu or, or just broke their leg or something like that. Um, and what this basically means that this 40% increase simply translates into a decrease of people either going into clinics or into uh, emergency rooms um, and hospitals. So, so, you know, you basically maintain, uh, you basically, you know, manage that capacity outside of, of, the, of the quartet. Once the patient has been, for example, uh, hospitalized, you know, you know, there's this strata of patients that will be hospitalized. Now there are tools being used for better risk assessment and planning. You know, there's, there's this length tool by EpiMed monitor system that is being used to estimate how long this patient is going to stay in the ICU, for example. You know, it says, for example, you know, currently the patient has been for four days and the estimated length is 13 days. This is, this is extremely important to manage the, the caseload within the ICU and to be able to forecast how much I can use, when will my beds be, beds be ready for more people to take, for more people to come in. And there are these scores that have been created. You know, these are these are scores that were already over there, but are, are being now modified for the particular case of COVID, uh, or you know, a sim, uh, simplified acute physiology score. You know, on the severity of this uh, in, in the ICU, as well as something called SOFA, which is the organ failure assessment, which is a common thing that happens in people on ventilators and ECMOs. Now, what this does is basically this helps in utilization forecasting, and this is this is something that people have been doing now to predict the number of ventilators. There's a lot of countries that are using AI and data driven, um, you know, data science to predict how many ventilators would I be needing. And, you know, they go down the spectrum and say, what is my daily growth in cases? What percentage of them am I looking at? Basically, which will be hospitalized based on the past data? What what percentage of hospitalization will require critical care, and how many of them will require ventilation support? And at the same time, mapping it to the capacity, you know, how many ventilators are currently not in use, how many will become available, for example, by using that length of stay indicator, and, uh, you know, how, and, and that may be available for future years, right? An example of that is, a perfect example of that is patient attribution in Sweden. And th this, this is phenomenal, what Sweden is doing, you know, this is, this is a chart, but I, and as you can see, the last date on this is I, I, I took the screenshot yesterday just just to convey the message. The last date on this is May four. This registry, this is connect. This is a national health ICU registry that is connected throughout the hospitals and is updated every thirty minutes to understand what is my ICU capacity right now, how much is it being used, and how much do I have, uh, so that patients can be allocated within X mile radius instead of going up to the hospital and they're saying, you know, we, they're raising their hands and saying we don't have any. Capacity, go take them to the next hospital and wasting important time. And you know, you can also transport between facilities because you know, someone on the floor that needs an ICU bed and there is no ICU bed in the ICU can be transported to another institution by just looking at it and seeing which institutions have capacity. So, you know, AI being used all uh, over there as well. Now, there so, are, sorry, going back to that curve. Uh, so, what's again, once again, what's the uh, origin, the blue? Could you explain that? Oh yeah, sure, sure. sure. Sorry, sorry. So this this is this is in Swedish. So what this basically oh. shows is this um, uh, the the this is the previous days the previous days usage 
and the current uh, and the current day's average usage, and then you can drill down onto the current you know, onto the exact current numbers as well. So this one basically shows throughout the year. This is the throughout the um, this is the timeline. This is this is the average usage across all institutions. And um, the this is uh, the one is the one in blue is the one that's from the previous day, and the one is is the current day. Thank you. So there, so now you know, as I mentioned, there, there's 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 collateral damage. You know, there's indirect impact as well. So there 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 uh, there are algorithms being used instead of simply making decisions on shut down all non-essential services without having a good definition of non-essential. You know, how do we create models that are more ethical? That not only say, okay, my definition of critical versus non-critical. But also take into allocate, you know, these are called allocation frameworks. Take into account how many lives would I be saying simply, uh, you know, whether I will be saving lives or not, to what will be the quality of life if I shut down the service um, during this pandemic. Similarly, it, simply not only saying how many life years will I save, but will there be an impact on lifelong productivity? For a particular for a particular patient, if I if I shut down this normal service, you know, for example, someone with a heart disease, <laughs> and the clinics are shut down, so um, you know, and then University of Pittsburgh actually came came out with, with one of these frameworks where um, you know where they're now, which, which is also very interesting on how do you uh, how do you in, introduce ethics and how do you introduce uh, you know, compassion into these machine learning models. You know, make sure that, that they're not biased because a lot of lot of the data that they're getting would, for example, say or for a particular segment of the population would say, you know, this is not this is not essential because the impact on that population is not as much. Whereas for the same thing, an impact on some other population would be high. So, so you know, these are these are frameworks. You know, future areas of research that they're 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 pointing at. So, so, you know, we talked, we talked about the response phase, you know, of how you know, the way AI is helping in our current response to keep the utilization at a, at, at a stage where, you know, our, our current capacity or, or improving or the slightly increased capacity can cater to it. How, where do we go from here? You know, as, as we are now looking into opening back our economies, you know, starting, you know, quote unquote, whatever the normal is. How do we open up and when do we open up and, and, you know, and how is AI and data science going to help there? You know, again, going back to the simulation that, that we did in the beginning, we use, I, I use the same parameters over here. How long should we keep this shut down, right? You know, again, this is um, this, using the same parameters. You know, this simulation, what this basically shows is that Longer the shutdown, of course, it's going to have an impact on the susceptible fraction. Again, remember, it's the susceptible fraction reduced, which basically translates into a reduction in the impacted. So, as you can see, as we keep the lockdown longer, it, it helps, but at some point it just flattens out, which means keeping it longer than that is not going to help at all. You know, it just basically plateaus at that point. Now the question becomes, okay, then how do we how, how do we decide how we how do we reopen? Do we reopen as soon as the peak starts coming down? And again, you know, what the simulation again using the simulation, if we end the shutdown early, which basically means we reach the peak and as we were going down, we start to re reopen. This, uh, you know, I ran the simulation using two distance, uh, you know, social distancing factors. And remember, we were at 0.6 when we were under capacity. And if we reopen too soon, the next peak is going to come back with a vengeance. It's going to be higher than the previous one. So, you know, and if we keep it longer, then the next peak is going to be smaller, even with a very low social distance, which point one, which basically simply maybe maybe not opening the cinema theaters or something like that. I don't know, I don't know whatever that is. But um, so if we keep it keep it longer, then, then it happens. Again, going back to the, so which basically means that we need to optimize these lockdowns so that we prevent, prevent these resurgence. Going back to that table where we showed off about how we could have these, uh, you know, we can open up the economy and have these triggers. 
On the right side is, is a chart that, uh, that's in the Imperial College of London report, which basically use something similar and says, if I pick an on trigger, on trigger means if my number of cases or number of ICU cases reaches, let's say 60 or 100 a week, I need to again institute lockdown measures, right? And, and which scenario of lockdown do I pick? Not just simply, oh yeah, just lockdown. Like, you know, which scenario of lockdown? Which pieces do I lock down so that I don't impact the entire economy? And they they made these uh, simulations over here, which basically shows that over a period of time, intermittent lockdowns with very low social distancing after the first peak is going to be sufficient to keep us under capacity. And this is where you know data science and machine learning will help us to understand. How do we open up and how do we then have intermittent lockdowns to make sure that we don't have big resurgence? What other thing in the recovery phase is going to be extremely important is to understand clinical pathways and outcomes. In the recovery phase is when now we will have some sort of a time, even though this could have happened during response phase, if there was an infrastructure, a data infrastructure in place, now that there isn't, you know, we, will, we can do this in the recovery phase as an understanding which patients, which group of patients ends up without a problem, right? You know, completely asymptomatic, and, you know, or maybe very mild symptoms. Which group ends up needing care, needing hospitalization even, um, and they recover, and which group actually ends up in ICU and ventilators? And we know that once a, some, once a person is on a ventilator, it's their chances of survival are, are, are not that great, right? So what is the, what are those underlying factors? You know, again, factors, not just clinical factors, socioeconomic factors, you know, behavioral factors, as well as clinical factors. What are those factors that, def, that describe which pathway the, clinic, the patient will follow? Now, this is going to be extremely important to understand which patients should be treated how and managed how. Again, you know, when there's no treatment right now, how should they be managed? Another thing that we will, we will have will basically do is comparative effectiveness. Remember, during the response phase, we were playing whack-a-mole. You know, something popping up, we're trying to manage that. Many of these trials that were happening, you know, they were heterogeneous. You know, there was no standards for these trials. Again, not to blame anybody, what the physicians and the, uh, the care providers at that time were doing. They had one objective that was to save lives. So they, you know, people were being given multiple regimens, knowing that you know, maybe none of them works. If, you know, there were no control in these trials. There were confounders in these trials, multiple confounders. So what we can do going forward is to understand the comparative effectiveness. You know, by for example, doing a meta, meta analysis on all of these. At the same time, figuring out if some parts of the trials which were maybe confounded or maybe not controlled well, how can we generate these auxiliary trials? You know, we just, just add on trials instead of you know, repeating the whole trial. And again, AI and you know, especially reinforcement learning um, used in trials can, can have an impact over there. Again, and I'm not going and again, you know, for on May 11, there will be a, you know, there will be a lecture on, on drug discovery and how how you know regimens and how treatments can be discovered. It will make we'll go a lot into detail uh, at that time. Which brings us to the last phase of, um, uh, of the crisis management, and that is mitigation. Now, once we go back, go into uh, our quote unquote normal, and the reason I'm saying quote unquote normal is who knows what that new normal is going to be. Uh, you know, we, we know this disease hasn't gone away. We know this disease spreads fast as it used to. We know a little bit more about the disease now than what we did when it started. But how do we control it and make sure that our health system is, is, is managed well? There are lots of things people are you know, trying out, people are suggesting, and, you know, and things that people are piloting. As an example, uh, you know, these surveillance te techniques um, in Australia, pandemic drones are, you know, have been actually approved um, to you know, on the right side uh, to do surveillance on, you know, for example, these are, you know, thermal scans that give you an idea of the temperature, if that person has a fever, 
are they coughing um uh, you know to try to uh, you know sort of isolate them and you know maybe point out if they if they, if they have if they have covid there's a lot there are lots of research you know again it's very very early stages we don't even know if it will work on trying to understand uh, is is there a particular tone to the cough or is there a particular frequency to the cough um, that can differentiate a regular cough from someone that has covid so that we can sort of put put you know put microphones in offices and other places and and do surveys and then there is this from landing ai there is this tool which actually uses cctv cameras to to understand how much social distancing people are adhering to it and again you know these these create lots of issues and lots of concerns on people's privacy you know lots of concerns on, on civil rights um but you know these, these many of these things are are being considered many of these ai techniques and technologies are being considered uh for um, use in the medication stage as we start to uh, you know live with this virus if you will other other things that are being used for example are in tools and contact tracing uh, there are mobile apps, various flavors of these mobile apps. Some use Bluetooth, some use a combination of Bluetooth and GPS, some use only GPS, some use only, you know, um, call, uh, you know, call records and whatnot. Um, and what, how it works is basically, you know, if two people meet for more than a few minutes, you know, and they, they exchange a token as long as they have this app and the Bluetooth is on, they exchange a token. And none of this information is made public to anybody till one of those people is now identified as COVID positive. And as soon as that patient is identified as COVID positive, all the people that came in contact with this patient are sent messages on this app that you were in touch with a particular patient that was COVID positive. Um, again, you know, for lots of privacy concerns, many of these, there are lots of frameworks people are suggesting on how to use this in a privacy preserving manner. NHS, NHS actually rejected the Apple Google uh, plan um, app because it just did not pass their, uh, you know, GDPR and, and EU muster. Um, so, you know, lo lots of issues with these apps. But, you know, again, in the mitigation stage, lots of avenues where, where AI can help, you know, again, in, in, in drug discovery and treatment selection and therapeutics, uh, again, which will be talked about in one of the, one of the future lectures. So, um, now, coming back to my favorite topic, you know, this is something that has been ignored for a long time now. You know, there's this lot, a lot of startups that work on digital health. There's a lot of buzz around digital health, but, but there wasn't a concerted effort on actually making this work because of a seamless ecosystem or, or having a seamless ecosystem or having a seamless, um, you know, uh, workflow on um, within payer systems and provider systems as well as you know um, within, within the public health uh, it was always on the radar it was always on something which looked pretty fancy on uh, research slides or these consultant slides that that charge you a lot of money um, and you know I, I i i pointed this quote out from asaf bornea uh, you know, who's, who's, uh, who's the CEO of one of the com companies that is funded by um, Philips and Teva, two large, uh, you know, two very large organizations. And he made this comment, the necessity is the mother of digital health, which basically says that, you know, we all ignored it enough. And COVID-19 has now shown us that there is a real necessity for this, because this is what's going to help us in managing many of these things in the future. And remember, um, you know, things like diabetes have been called pandemics for a long time now, you know, they're not real pandemics, but given how, how prevalent they are, it's, it's, it's almost called, called, called a, you know, quote unquote pandemic and even in those diseases. Um, so I'm not only saying this because this is, this is my area of research, but, but this is something that's going to play a bigger role and governments really need to invest in a strong uh, digital health ecosystem. And, 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 and thankfully in Qatar, uh, you know, this is one of the strategic pillars um, uh, that, that, that the health, uh, health system is, is, working on, is working on. We're, we're in very early stages, but, I, but this is identified, identified as one of the, one of the key, key drivers. So um, in conclusion, 
AI and data science, uh, as we, you know, as hopefully I was able to demonstrate, are being used in the current response phase uh, for managing the health services in the pandemic. Uh, it can play a key role as we go into recovery and mitigation phases. Um, having said that, honestly, preparedness has no alternative. You know, it's 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 like insurance. Everybody hates paying for it uh, till you need it. So we need to invest in being prepared. And part of preparing that, coming from an AI and data science perspective, is to build these health exchange data exchange platforms. Is to build these health data platforms. Is to invest in digital health, um, which is going to be a key factor in in our uh, in our new normal. Um, that uh, thank you, uh, and we'll be happy to, to take questions. So thank you very much, Vezel. A uh, couple of questions that that came up were, uh, like for the Swedish case, uh, so is their ICU capacity overwhelmed or not? It's, uh, uh, not not according to the not according to the charts. There there were there were pretty few regions, uh, and overall capacity was was not overwhelmed. There were few regions um, where um, there was a much broader older population than, than you know, the mix of the population was skewed towards the older population. They were ha having strains, but you know, strain on the ICUs. But remember what they what they did was they made sure that they do patient attribution to these institutions that you know they don't rush to the nearest institution necessarily. They rush them to the institution that uh, has the capacity that actually that has the forecasted capacity. Uh, remember, um, COVID-19 is not, in majority of the cases I'm talking about, is not one of those things like someone has a heart attack and they need, you know, a ventilator or something right away, right? They, they, there's a time where you can actually plan. So if a hospital has a forecasted capacity, then you would take that patient there, hospitalize them on the floor till they actually need that. So, 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 you know, so tools like this are extremely critical, critical over there. So, you know, as far as my knowledge goes that they, they did not, um, even though their death rates are slightly higher than the rest of the region, uh, but that's mostly because they, they never instituted any, any, uh, any lockdowns, uh, it was all on social distancing uh, at an individual level. Yeah, I think Sweden was a very interesting case. They had no yeah, exactly. lockdowns and yet they were able to. Another question was, uh, I mean, this was more related to the app you mentioned, the COVID app. Uh, it, it, you know, there's a similar app from uh, MOI called Etheraz. Do you know anything about it, or what's the update on that? Or yes, um, yeah, So there, there is there is an app uh, called Etheraz, um, which is uh, which is supposed, you know so, sort of serves sort of dual purpose. It's it's an informational app as well as uh, planned to be a contact tracing app. Does need access to your Bluetooth and GPS if you if you download it. Um, uh, currently, how it's going to be used, um, you know, uh, is is not very very clear at least from the public information. But it, it is definitely a you know a contact tracing app as well as an information app because what it does is if someone is known to be COVID positive, their barcode color actually is red, and that barcode is not only just a you know just a color a flag. It also is their, their information, so they can actually take that to a health center and that can be scanned and their, their history can be, can be brought up. Um, so, so yes, that, that, that is in fact, 1 of the, 1 of the apps that, uh, that, that I mentioned, um, is based on this based on similar platforms. Right, thank you. Another question was, uh, do you know, uh, do you know if AI is being used to understand all countries policy response to lockdown measures and reopening economies? WHO have expressed concerns that if countries like UK and US reopen too soon, it'll have a big impact on developing countries. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, it's one of the one of the things that I mentioned. You know, many of these models that are being created on resurgence and other things do consider uh, mobility patterns, do consider your flight flights and travel patterns, in uh, and, and uh, to understand that. So, um, so many of these uh, data scientists and you know, public health experts are using data science and AI to to map that out, uh, and that's why they're kind of saying and it's not purely anecdotal that they're saying that you know early uh, create you know opening up too early may have may have a rebound effect. 
not just within within the country, but because of the global mobility. You know, we were, you know, never in the history of mankind has have people traveled so much uh, between between places um, as we do nowadays. Uh, that is also being taken uh, taken into account. So another related question to resurgence was, you know, uh, what's the logic behind their, you know, second bump, second resurgence being even higher than the early opening? I mean, the second peak is sometimes higher than the. Uh, right. So, so remember, um, uh, so, so that's a good point. So, uh, one of the things that happens is, you know, when I was, for example, running this simulation, um, in the, in the first bump, the input basically is that when the when the people that are exposed start growing going up from a point which is very low, which is zero or very low, right? In the second bump, what, what happened was, I, what I simply did in the simulation was the output of the first uh, simulation went into the, in, as the input of the second simulation, which basically means that there were a lot of people at that time that were exposed and infected, right? So once you release the social distancing measures, imagine there's a lot of these people that will go out that don't many of them don't even know that they are they're infected and can actually you know do can, can actually infect a lot of other people you know having a longer tail which basically means that many of those infected people will now actually not shed virus you know they will many of these will um, will actually you know cure themselves or, you know or, or or just be cured automatically uh, and and will in fact lesser people than they would if immediately I were to you know remember it's it's the it's the fraction of the population that's still infected that goes in, into the uh, second portion of the model and that's a lot higher than if you look at the first first uh, first version. There's actually a Qatar specific question too. It says Qatar has the highest per thousand confirmed cases by a significant margin in the GCC. Why do you think Qatar has not yet resorted to uh, lockdown measures, even for a week? I guess it probably has, but I guess it may be extreme lockdown measures. Since yeah, so, uh, so obvious. yeah, I mean, um, uh, one of the reasons for our high um, high numbers is is the mix of the population. You know, we have a very large worker population in industrial areas. You know, if you look at the hotspots, you know, that's one of the hotspots and. And the living conditions there, you know, there are many people, many of these laborers living in one room. One person gets infected; it's basically everyone else getting infected. So that's that's one of the reasons there's a large number of people. Um, and uh, and it's a good question, you know, why we haven't gone into a specific lockdown is, you know, again going back to these data driven data driven uh, methodologies. Um, as far as till now, the data has shown us that our severity is on the lower side, and even when we are on the one of the highest cases per per hundred thousand or per per million. Uh, our ICU ICU usage is is not high at all. Uh, you know our, our hospitalization rates is not high at all. Again, th that doesn't mean that's not going to change because a lot of the cases right now were coming from industrial area, which is young laborers, very strong, sturdy people. As it uh, gets into the broader society, where there are you know, uncles and aunts and parents and grandparents and, you know, ups and juds and all of that. So it's going to be a completely different story. Um, but, you know, many of these things go into that decision making uh, again. So it's, I, I think in, the, in their infinite wisdom, the policymakers are, are looking at that. I, that. That would be my guess. Okay. I think maybe you can conclude with this like final sort of higher level question about AI. Uh, you know, so what is it in general? What is your perception that, you know, and if you had a report card of how AI and ML are doing in this, you know, to respond to the pandemic, what, what would you, what would you think? You know, so, so um, you know, to, to, to be honest, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's a dichotomy, you know, there's, there's two things to it. One, um, there's a lot of hype that is created, uh, which, uh, to be honest, um, it, um, a lot of it is created by researchers like us, but it, it, it's counterproductive. It actually comes back to hurt us. And by saying, oh, I'll do this COVID, uh, you know, and again, there was a very um, scathing review on one of the papers that was published on identifying COVID uh, by x-rays and using that as an alternate test strategy, which basically shows that they don't really understand how, how the health systems are working. Because by the time you can tell someone has COVID from their x-ray, you don't honestly need to say that. But they are so sick 
that you know there will already be some. On the other hand, you know AI and data science has really shown its value, and people are now believing more firmly in it than the people that were initially hesitant for the AI. And you know, as you can see in many of these technologies that, that, that are being used. So, so it's, it's, it's at, at both ends. Uh, the one thing that I would like to mention is that we could have done much better, much better had we been prepared, had we have access to the data in the right time, we could have done a much better job using our AI technologies if we were prepared, if there was enough investment and enough uh, you know, emphasis on creation of these data platforms and creation of these data sharing strategies. Um, a, a lot of the AI things that are very promising and have not been able to show uh, impact is because we weren't able to get data and because of the lack of data. Great. Okay, thank you, Faisal, for this very interesting talk. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And hopefully, you will get a chance to uh, you know, come to our lecture again on Thursday. Again, see you then. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.